the last two lectures of this course are going to be about Noam Chomsky. I believe that Chomsky is more of a philosopher than a empirical or field linguist. I already gave you some evidence for this stance in my lecture on Chomsky's poverty of the stimulus argument. I'm going to criticize Chomsky because of his two theories. The first one is his universal grammar, and the second is his opinion on the emergence or evolution of language. I want to say up front that I am not sure if Chomsky's universal grammar is a correct theory. I just want to show you some counter evidence to his position. But I also want you to know that I strongly believe that Chomsky is completely wrong about his account of the evolution of language. There is nothing right in there. And I'm going to talk about that next week. Noam Chomsky was born in 1928. He is an American linguist, philosopher, and also a social critic. Some people call him the father of modern linguistics. The same people have probably forgotten about Charles Sanders Peirce and Ferdinand de Saussure. Chomsky studied under supervision of Quine. Chomsky moved to Harvard University to study under Quine. His PhD thesis supervisor was Quine's colleague Nelson Goodman. And Chomsky was also heavily influenced by John L. Austen and his Oxfordian school of ordinary language philosophy. Nowadays, Chomsky teaches at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Chomsky is a very important figure in the history of philosophy of language and linguistics, mainly because he rediscovered innatism, claiming that language faculty is innate in the brain. According to Chomsky, this explains children's language acquisition that is based on non-systematic parental input. I want to remind you that Chomsky is strongly against behaviorism and he thinks that our language capacity must be hardwired in our brains when we are born. Chomsky also invented something called transformative grammar or generative grammar. Some people say that there is a difference between transformative and generative grammar, but to be honest, I cannot see the difference. This kind of grammar presumes the existence of universal deep structures under arbitrary surface structures in any language. And this is the topic I'm going to talk about in this lecture. Let me make a small digression from Chomsky's philosophy of language and his linguistics. I told you that he is also a social critic, so I would like to say at least few sentences about his political views. Chomsky is a left-wing political activist. Usually he calls himself libertarian socialist or a sympathizer of anarcho-syndicalism, whatever these positions really mean. The main characteristics of his political thought is that he is an outspoken critic of the United States government, and I believe that sometimes he goes just too far. When he was in Olomouc in 2014, he gave a lecture on his linguistics, but also on his political views, and let me quote a small passage from it. There were, of course, dissidents in Eastern Europe, in fact, but they are very different from the dissidents from elsewhere in the world. Some sense that the Eastern Europe was uniquely oppressed. In fact, it was oppressed, but by comparative standards, much less than in the US domains, much less. You didn't have hundreds of thousands of people slaughtered. You didn't have archbishops assassinated while they are reading mass. You don't have intellectuals whose heads were blown off by Russian-trained terrorist forces, and on and on. The record in, say, Latin America or Philippines, Southeast Asia, 
is much worse than in Eastern Europe in the post-Stalin era. I don't want to comment on this a lot. I just think that this is bizarre. I feel that um, Chomsky's hatred to the United States government just blinds him and he cannot see that the situation in still in Russia and in Eastern Bloc in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s was probably much worse than in the US domains. Mm, I just don't want to talk about it. Please have a look at his lecture. The link is in your presentation. Well, let me get back to Chomsky's philosophy of language and linguistics. Let's get back to his theory of universal grammar. Chomsky is very confident that all human beings in the world share the same universal grammar, this deep structure in our language that is common to all of us. In his paper Derivation by Face from 1999, Chomsky, for example, wrote this. If a Martian was looking at humans the way we look at, say frogs, the Martian might conclude that there's fundamentally one language with minor deviations. It means, according to Chomsky, that all the languages in the world, English, Czech, Slovak, French, German, Chinese, Indian languages, whatever, uh, are the same in their deep structure. And this Chomsky's Confidence is shared by other proponents of universal grammar. For example, this is a quote from a very famous book by Steven Pinker called The Language Instinct from 1994. Pinker wrote, According to Chomsky, a visiting Martian scientist would surely conclude that aside from their mutually unintelligible vocabularies, earthlings speak a single language. Unquote. Well, that surely is very important, I think, because Chomsky and Pinker and other proponents of universal grammar are very sure that their theory is the only right one, that they are correct. Well, I'm not sure about that. And I want to give you some counter evidence, as I said, to this position. When we talk about universal grammar, we have to go back a little bit in the history of linguistics. So let me start with Joseph Greenberg, an American linguist with an interest in linguistic typology and the classification of languages. According to Greenberg, all languages in the world have common features. For example, the universal presence of subjects and objects or the universal presence of nouns and verbs, consonants and vowels, and so on and so on. Well, I think that uh, this is quite banal mm, finding, mm, because while well, languages are based on subjects and objects, nouns and verbs, consonants and vowels, and we can probably imagine any system of communication without this. But Greenberg created a set of 45 more detailed common features of any language, and he called these language universals. Greenberg's universals were in typology, morphology, and syntax, and Greenberg based his theory on the study of 30 languages, so I think that we should take Greenberg's ideas seriously. For example, here is number 36, rule number 36. If a language has the category of gender, it always has the category of number. And according to Greenberg and many others, these rules mm, are true for any language in the world. There is an alternative view on the universality of languages, and this is usually called linguistic relativity. It is based on a simple idea according to which language determines thought. The differences in languages 
determine the differences in thought. So, for example, English speakers not only speak differently than Czech speakers, they also think differently. This idea has quite deep roots in European and mainly American linguistic thought. It was held, for example, by a German philosopher Wilhelm von Humboldt in the end of the 18th century, or by German anthropologist Franz Boas in the end of the 19th century. But I think that the most famous proponents of this approach were American linguists with an interest in anthropology, Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Horf. Their theory is usually called Sapir-Horf hypothesis, and it was based on a study of eskimo allowed languages, mainly spoken by Inuit in northern Alaska. In 1949, Benjamin Lee Horf wrote a paper called Science and Linguistics, and he published it in Scientific American, which means that it's written in a very simple and clear manner. Please read it if you are interested in stuff like this. In his Scientific American paper, Horf wrote this. We have the same word for falling snow, snow on the ground, snow hard packed like ice, slushy snow, wind-driven snow, whatever the situation may be. To an Eskimo, this all-inclusive word would be almost unthinkable. This is an illustration from Horf's article, and as you can see on the right side, there is a picture of English with one word for snow and with Eskimo that have three words for the same stuff. And there are also other examples. For instance, in Hopi language, there is just one word for a plane, a dragonfly, and a pilot. In English, we of course have these three words I uttered right now. And uh, there are also some differences between Hopi and English in the understanding of water. Sapir's and Horf's ideas got very popular, not only in linguistics, but also in pop culture. So sometimes you can read that in Eskimo languages, there are not only three words for snow, but 50 of them, or maybe 100 of them. I'm not sure if Sapir's and Horf's idea is correct, because I think that in English, we can understand the difference between falling snow and snow on the ground and snow hard packed like ice, slushy snow, and so on and so on. For example, if you get in contact with snow a lot, if you ski a lot, you understand the difference between a regular snow and so-called fern. The point is that maybe we do not have special terms for these types of snow, but we can describe them as I have done a few seconds ago, falling snow, snow on the ground. I am using Russell's theory of descriptions when talking about different kinds of snow. Well, I'm not sure if linguistic relativity in Sapir's and Horst's writings is well defined and if it really has a persuasive evidence. But I also think that later on, during the 20th century, linguistic relativity get more persuasive evidence. And I'm going to talk about it in my next slide. This is Danielle Everett, an American field linguist and an author of the book Language, the Cultural Tool that was published in 2013. Everett, as a Christian missionary, was sent to translate the Bible to Piraha people in the Amazonia region, whose language is used by about 300 speakers and for years it had resisted translation. Everett was very hardworking, and after a few years, he was able to translate most of Piraha language into English. To his surprise, Everett found out that Piraha language contradicted Chomsky's theory of universal grammar, because it did not include some crucial language universals, mainly recursion. 
I'm not sure if you understand what the recursion is, but according to Chomsky and many others, it is an essential quality of any language. Recursion means the ability to apply the same linguistic rule again and again and again. Sometimes it is called nesting, because we can put something into something, and this something again we can put into something else, and so on and so on at infinitum. For example, I can say using recursion the day after tomorrow, and the day after the day after tomorrow, and the day after the day after the day after tomorrow, and so on. Or I can say that he is his great, 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 great grandson. And I can again use recursion to prolong this utterance at infinitum again. Everett published a highly controversial paper called Cultural Constraints on Grammar and Cognition in Piraha. It was published in the journal Current Anthropology and the storm of criticism started because, as I said, it was highly controversial because it was strongly against Chomskyan universal grammar. Everett believed that he had found out a language without recursion. The reason was that the Piraha language is one of the simplest languages now, as Everett wrote in his 2005 paper. Piraha culture constrains communication to non-abstract subjects which fall within the immediate experience of interlocutors. This constraint explains a number of very surprising features of Piraha grammar and culture. The absence of numbers of any kind, or a concept of counting and of any terms for quantification, the absence of color terms, the absence of embedding, the simplest pronoun inventory known, the absence of relative tenses, the simplest kinship system yet documented, the absence of creation myths and fiction, the absence of any individual or collective memory of more than two generations past, the absence of drawing or other art, and one of the simplest material cultures documented, and the fact that the Piraha are monolingual after more than 200 years of regular contact with Brazilians and the Tupi Guarani speaking Kavahif. If you believe in what Everett found out, you can see that this might be an evidence for linguistic relativity. The simplicity of Piraha language determines the simplicity of Piraha's thought and their culture. Well, I'm not sure if Everett was really right, but I think that this is a nice counter evidence, as I said, uh, against Chomsky's universal grammar. Unfortunately for linguistics, the discussion between Everett and Chomsky is not very civilized. Chomsky doesn't think that Everett is a real expert in linguistics. He calls him a charlatan sometimes. And Everett thinks of Chomsky that he is not a real scientist too, because he's something like a guru of a sect or a cult of Chomskyan devotees. There are some very interesting popular articles about the topic, like for example, Klapintus, the interpreter from the New Yorker, or Tom Barlett's Angry Words that was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education. If you are interested in the dispute between Everett and Chomsky, please watch this short documentary from Smithsonian Channel. It is called The Grammar of Happiness, and maybe you can find it somewhere on the internet. Name calling is not an argument. And this is the reason why I'm not very interested in Chomsky's insults and Everett's offenses. 
I believe that more promising evidence comes from Lara Borodicki, a Belarusian-born American cognitive linguist. Her research is really interdisciplinary because she uses insights and methods from linguistics, psychology, neuroscience and anthropology. And its main advantage is that she collects data from China, Greece, Chile, Indonesia, Russia and Aboriginal Australia. This is very advantageous because Chomsky builds his theories on his knowledge of mother tongue, which is English, his high school French and maybe a bit of Hebrew thanks to his family origin. Boroditsky finds more powerful examples of linguistic relativity and language shape in thought, and I will give you some examples in my next slide. If you want to learn more about the topic, please read an overview by Boroditsky in Scientific American from 2011. The paper is called How Language Shapes Thought, and you can find it in Moodle. Boroditsky belongs to a long tradition of linguists who think that language shapes thought, who think that there is something like linguistic relativity. I will give you three examples from Boroditsky's research, and these will be about colors, gender, and directions. Let me start with color. According to Boroditsky and many others, Various languages divide color continuum in a different way. Let me give you just this sample. In Russian, there are two terms, galuboy and sini, for different shades of blue. In English, we have just light blue and dark blue. And in Russian, there is no general term for blue, which means that the speakers of Russian and speakers of English have probably sensorial stimuli of the outer world a bit different. They understand the world in a bit different way. Another example comes from gender. You understand probably that gender is completely accidental and random. For instance, in German, the brique is feminine, and in Spanish, el puente is masculine. These are German and Spanish terms for the bridge. The interesting thing is that when Germans describe bridges, they usually associate adjectives like beautiful, elegant, fragile, peaceful, pretty or slender that are more feminine. Spanish speakers think more of big, dangerous, long, strong, sturdy and towering these are more masculine qualities and it would be complete mystery why Germans would think of bridges using these adjectives and Spanish would use other adjectives. The only reason is a random difference in gender, di brique, el puente. The last example is about directions. In English, we define a space relative to an observer. We do the same in Czech language and in all European languages, probably. So it means that we talk about right, left, forward, and back. According to Borodicki, Cook Thayori language spoken by Aboriginal Australians defines space in cardinal direction terms. It means that speakers of this language use terms like north, south, east, and west. Their understanding of space and the world is a bit different than ours. I'm not sure if you know where north is right now when you're sitting at your rooms or classrooms, but speakers of Cook Thayori language know this all the time. So I believe that this is partial but quite persuasive evidence for the hypothesis of linguistic relativity. Nowadays, there exists quite radical opposition to Chomsky's theory of universal grammar. 
let me give you one last example. It is from the paper The Myth of Language Universals that was published in Behavioral and Brain Sciences in 2009. And that was written by cognitive scientists Nicholas Evans and Stephen C. Levinson. Quote, Languages are much more diverse in structure than cognitive scientists generally appreciate. A widespread assumption among cognitive scientists growing out of the generative tradition in linguistics is that all languages are English-like, but with different sound systems and vocabularies. The true picture is very different. Languages differ so fundamentally from one another at every level of description, sound, grammar, lexicon, meaning, that it is very hard to find any single structural property they share. The claims of universal grammar, we argue here, are either empirically false, unfalsifiable, or misleading in that they refer to tendencies rather than strict universals. Structural differences should instead be accepted for what they are and integrated into a new approach to language and cognition that places diversity at central stage. Again, to repeat myself, I don't know where the truth is, but I want to give you just one last advice. If you hear that Noam Chomsky is a genius who cannot go wrong, and his universal grammar is the only game in town, be cautious and try to be vigilant. Maybe, just maybe, the truth is somewhere else.